Uh, it's a bit dark in here, isn't it? Uh, what is it? Half eleven at night, Sunday night. Um, no idea how long I'm going to be on this for. Trying to, <laughs> trying to learn a song. I haven't picked up my guitar for so long, uh, for various different reasons, and um, just trying to get. I wanted to get the chord boxes for it, and um, rather than like. Well, I already, already suspect that I'm not necessarily going to make a uh, really great job of it in places. So I'll have to find a workaround because there's bits of it that are not really... ...that happy with trying to emulate. Long summer, my. Um, just stop there a minute. Oh. So rather than wait until I can play it, I thought I would just go through the experience on a live. This is going to be different. <laughs> Just, there's a guitar. There's a TV, which is, um, what's it doing? It's, um, I'm streaming from an iPad, from this iPad, up to the TV, so I can see it. A little bit bigger. Um, it's a great Clash song. Well, Clash sort of done the most what the most famous version of it. Um, but it's actually written and sung by Timon Dog. Um, and there's a good little story about this because um, I always wanted to know what the, his version of it was like. So on um, Apple, uh, on Mu Apple Music or on Spotify or something, I think it was on Apple Music, I searched for it and I played it and I thought, this is a different song, but this is really cool, I really like this. And it was, um, what happened is the record company had uploaded it in, in the wrong sequence, this album, this Timon Dog album. And as a result, um, the track Lose This Skin uh, wasn't Lose This Skin. It was a track called uh, Something To Prove. And it's a great track. It's a really great track. Um, I would say check it out, but if you search for Something To Prove by Timo and Dog, you'd probably get some other track from the album. I wrote to the company. They thanked me for letting them know, but they didn't fix it. Um, you know, wrote to the like sent an email to the record company. Do you realize you've uploaded them in the wrong sequence? But I'm glad you did because I found another song by your artist that um, I wouldn't have found otherwise. Um, anyway, something to prove by Timon Dog, brilliant. Um, bit of 
materialistic satire, probably the best way to put that. And uh, yeah, he's quite a, he's quite a guy. But anyway, he this was on Clash's album Sandinista, which a lot of people um, that like the Clash didn't think that was really much of an album. It's a triple album. But in the words of Joe Strummer, the singer, uh, he said, "I love." I love Sandinista, warts and all. And um, I sort of feel the same way. It's, it, there's a, I mean, there's every type of music on that album. It's just amazing. They've got Mikey Dredd there, uh, you know, sort of dub reggae from back in the day. Um, and having, they were just having a little go at everything. Anyway, and, and I think the following album, Combat Rock, which has got all the hits on it, it probably focusing the next album down to a single album after London Calling was a very, very excellent double album. Sandinista was a triple album. Going back to the one, I think it, it sort of really edited. I think Combat Rock was a great album as well. Um, I had uh, Should I Stay or Should I Go on it and Rock the Casbah and um, various other things, Know Your Rights, stuff like that. Um, but um, other tracks on there, uh, Sean Flynn, um, Overpowered by Funk, I love because the rap on there by Futura 2000 uh, is a track of his called uh, something like The Conquests or something of Futura, and it's The Clash returning the favour. He's rapping and they're playing on one of his tracks. And I love that, especially now. It's so pre-gangster rap it's so kind of um like rapper's delight it's so kind of rice and peas chicken bone <laughs> rings and ribs it's about graffiti in but it, it's just so honest it's so simple um not technically brilliant but i just love i love the way that it didn't have to be so I found myself playing that recently. Anyway, um, so Lose This Skin. It's like, a, I have to swear here to get the feel across. To me, Lose This Skin is like the cackle of a, well, of, of, I was gonna say something else, but like the cackle of, a, of an old serving wench, you know, in some old um, seedy sailor's bar back in the 1800s or something. It, it's just a shrill, it's one of those songs that for a while I couldn't really see. I wouldn't say I couldn't see the point of it, but I wasn't that bothered about it. But in some way, for some reason, it, it's it's like there's something wrong about the song in such a great way that I just love it. I, it you know, it's one of those songs you think you could play it and any number of people could turn around and say, what the f Fucking hell is this? Can you just turn that shit off, you know? And and I just love that it just punches through that and it it, it just says, well, I'm going to kind of wail in your ear um, whether you like it or not. I'm not going to have any considerations about myself. I'm just going to put this out the way it comes out and you know, it's, it's produced properly and it's it's all the things that it should be if it's made it on the album, which for Sandinista wasn't always the case. There's some things on there with songs played backwards and stuff where you think, okay, I might skip this track. Um, but I just love it and the lyrics are fantastic. And I feel like I'm giving an intro to a song that I'm about to play, but as I started off by saying, I'm not really about to play it. Uh, I'm about to try and play it. So I'm just going to... Have another look at it and I probably won't play the whole thing all the way through. Uh, I'm just going to do bits of it. I just thought it would be interesting to show what poor old um, struggling guitarist has to go through in order to finally give up on playing a song he really wanted to play. This <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not going to play too loud because it's 20 to 12 and I've just been outside with my neighbours and they're getting themselves tucked up in bed, so who knows what this sounds like. I 
there's this A, is that an augmented, mm -hmm. A plus, A augmented, and I need chord boxes, I don't know what to do with this A. I can hear it in the song that it, you have the A and then, I'll just, that's a suspended something or other. So if I slow it right down, you know on TikTok you see these people mimicking along and I've actually watched people making those and they slow the, you know, you have the option to slow it right all the way down so that when you play it back at speed you're in sync. Uh, pretty handy for rap tracks to try and get your head around the rhythms and the words and everything. Um, it's got to, I need to put that in. I can't just leave an A there. be a A7 or something. I think a friend of mine, Ian, who, who probably won't see this, but he might do, he's, he's certainly probably the only person who taught me guitar was him. And um, I didn't have too many lessons. <laughs> uh, and then um, he, Ian, if you're watching, not now, but at some point in the future. I know you're not going to like this song, but to find someone who can actually bleed and play it, it would be so nice to hear it. I don't even know, like, key for my voice. I have no idea. I probably should play it with a capo and play it some other way. And because I haven't played for long, I feel like my fingers are going to bleed. <laughs> yeah, this is it. This is why I did this, rather than, like, learn it and then play it and say, there you go. It's like, you can feel my pain. And the only thing is that I have, a, I shouldn't probably say this, but I have a pretty, pretty good, intelligent prediction that I'm probably not going to complete the learning to play this song. All right, and there's a middle, a, There's a D5. I wonder if I can get away with just a regular D, probably not. Let's have a little look. Oh my god. I almost can't play the guitar anymore. That's ridiculous. I was saying I was Jack the Biscuit back in the day. <laughs> Anybody remember that, Jack? He thinks he's Jack the Biscuit. Uh, okay. We're alone. So they Say, oh, I'll put. A, I'll just have a D rather than a D five. When not on in that way. When we're on, oh. oh. Okay, okay. Here we go. When this is the bridge. Oh, we start with the bridge, or or, or definitely don't. We're alone, so they say We're not alone in that way When we're alone, it's real tough going We tend to take the part in someone else's play Come with me, oh we go Come with me, I thought he said but That's not him anymore, he's dead What's it like to be so free? So free it looks like lost to me. I've gotta lose this skin I'm imprisoning. Gotta lose it, lose this skin I'm imprisoning. That's a really, really, really lovely. Why is it really, really, really lovely? I've got a friend of mine, Michael Zentner. Michael, who is a proper bona fide virtuoso electronic violinist. I mean, he's 
magnificent. Um, and he's worked with names we all know and love. Anyway, he's... Um, Timon Dog, I think he plays a violin as well. And yeah, I'm just listening now. It's, it's some, he's good too. I have a feeling Michael might be better, but it doesn't matter. It, like better technically or something. Both of them make the thing sing. And once again, going back, I think with Michael, he's um, really very sort of fusion prog rock sort of influence probably. Um, this guitar has been like held away for ages. I can hear it creaking and cracking as it's just sort of taking the moisture or doing whatever guitars do when you've put them away for a while. Anyway, um, he, um, yeah, he's Michael Zent now. Google him. He's he's um, very technically gifted uh, artist. Um, but Timon, in the true spirit of this song, it just, the violin work on it, once again, it's just, I just almost want to say that the song is like an old, it's really bad, but I'm, I'm trying to, I mean this in the nicest possible way, but it's like an old hag who isn't, is just being an old hag, is like no point, who was the, uh, Flaunt the Imperfection, who's that, uh, was that um, China Crisis, had an album called Flaunt the Imperfection, and I think that's the thing, is like, rather than sort of saying, oh, introverting me on a bit that you're not very good at. He's just like, no, I'll go straight through it. And there's nothing in that song that isn't very good either. But I just feel that it's one of those songs that sort of drills into your head. And um, and it doesn't care. That's the best thing. Maybe it's in a key and a, it's very mid-range. It's not, it's not so much bass, not so much high end. It's, it sounds good probably on a transistor radio, but... And then he, his voice, I thought it was Toya, and I thought they changed the name to Timon Dog as like some sort of, um, like Michael Allen, one of his albums had Billy S. Those of you who know the world of bass guitarists who might have a clue as to Billy S is, but I'm not going to say who it was, it's just Billy S. For possibly for reasons, contractual reasons maybe, I don't know. Anyway, so um, that's what I thought. It sounded like Toya singing the song and and no it's this guy this he's got some sort of i don't know if he's from yorkshire lancashire manchester he's up somewhere up there he's got and he's got that kind of even sounds like the accents there in the singing which i'm not saying toya does but anyway that's the nearest thing i could put to it the, the clash particularly on sandinista i mean they work with the blockheads you know injury and the blockheads um on that album they work with all kinds of people on there so I, for my whole life of hearing that thing, I thought it was Toya. Then I found out it was Timon, and I just kind of, in the back of my mind, without even knowing, I just sort of rejected that. No, no, no sorry. You know, Timon. No one's called Timon except Timon and Pumbaa. No one, you know. Anyway, um, yeah, Timon Dog. Well done. Take my hat off to you, mate. It's, it's a beautifully uh, shrill piece of heart on your sleeve um uh artistry which is really lovely sort of thing i would love to sit like i am now with five or six other musicians and just sort of unplugged that one out um late at night um yeah i don't know it's just it's just a it gets my attention that song so much and yet, it's almost like if someone said, oh, what's your favourite song or, or name some songs you really love, I probably wouldn't mention it. But the weirdest thing is that if I go to say, okay, what's my favourite song, one song, and I go to say this song, and I'm like, that can't be right. Is that really? Is that my favourite? And I'm like, if I've only got to have one song, I probably would have this. And yet it's not one of those songs, that I, you know, where you just play and play because you love it. I this song is just, it, it, there's something about the song that is, has so much beauty in how wrong it is. That's what I love about it. And it, it's not wrong, the song, but that's the best way I can describe it. It just, 
it's like someone with a wart on their nose who just says hi or of night hi I'm, you know every every word i say is an apology for the fact that you're having to look at me with a wart on my nose it 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 just doesn't even get into that it just says hi and it's down to you to say no oh, i can have that yeah hi it so it's three and a half minutes four and a half minutes yeah it fades and comes back so it's yeah it's like it just boots the door down says i'm coming in and you're like, okay fuck it come in and sit down uh, and then it probably doesn't sit down either and then when you think oh, that was quite amazing let me talk about it it's like get something fucks off and you're like oh, what the what the what was that for and then you look and you think i don't know but i feel better it just blown the cobwebs off of me in some way it it just doesn't agree it's, i suppose punk was about that it it isn't a middle class acceptable I, I had in my punk days in the end of my punk days I put together a little album and it's called Tamed for Fortune and that was the beginning of the end you know that was the, what you would call the sellout that's trying to get approval from the very wrong you shouldn't really be looking for approval anyway but but when you do we always tend to look at it through it's like a trap isn't it it always tend to try and get it from the wrong places um person didn't give you approval it tends to get you craving it so the sort of person that wouldn't give you approval is the last person you should be craving it from but you shouldn't crave it anyway <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So this song just strips all that out. And, so, and Tim and Doc, when you listen to Something to Prove, the track by him, you realise that it's a bit like John Cooper Clark for anyone who knows, you know, or, or Morrissey from The Smiths or Mark Smith from, from The Fall. They just, they just say, that this is what I've got. And so that's what's going to happen. And you can take it or leave it. That's, I think, what it is. The, the, the song really gives me the sense of take it or leave it. There are other tracks on, on the album. And most songs, even most songs I like, you get the feeling that they tried to make a great song. And they did. You know? Um, but this is just like, I don't care if it's a great song or not. I've got this bunch of, this bunch of shit to say in this way and pam there it is and then you're like well okay you gotta love that it didn't don't hold back <laughs> and it didn't and and when you look closer it's actually also not a bad song it's not a wrong song it's not but it just somehow the, the whole thing just doesn't ask for approval it just comes in boots the door down and just goes slam there it is and yet Something like Killing in the Name of or Wake Up, Rage Against the Machine. That boots the door down as well. But but you listen, you think, oh, it's proper rock and roll song and all the rest of it. So it somehow it's conforming. And yet, you know, it has it's, they are fantastic tracks, those two. I mean, the guitar work on Killing in the Name of is just beautiful. And of course, Wake Up, which we know from um, The Matrix, is perfect and what a fantastic lambast of the whole deep state stuff that's that song is it's absolutely fantastic um hoover he was a body remover i mean <laughs> beautiful absolutely beautiful um but somehow something about it it's sort of i suppose because it fits within accepted guidelines they might not be asking for um approval but although it's its own song, it doesn't really sound like anything. It's sitting within accepted sort of frameworks. Whereas Lose This Skin is like, what the bloody hell is that? Is it a folk song? It's kind of a folk song <laughs> done by a ex-punk rock, ex-punk band that are now a rock band uh, that play any kind of music they want. But it's, this doesn't even fit into that. So... Um, and 
as the song goes, you're aware that it's actually very different, and yet it's still, you know, it's still a, a pop song, you could even call it. But it's different, and there's no uh, requesting your permission. It just, it, it, it just is. So it might sound like a big build-up, I'm not trying to give it the big build-up, although I, I love the song. I'm just trying to explain what it is. And you could hear it and forget you've ever heard it. Fine, I'm not saying that that won't happen. We could hear it and make sure you never hear it again. I'm not saying and that that might happen. But um, it's not out of tune or anything. It just is a wailing cackle thrown at you. It's just designed to smack you in the face and walk out <laughs> and then you're like okay um what should we you know how do we follow that um but i like that i like that about that song anyway and my fingers are really really sore already this guitar is so heavy the action on it i had a i bought it because i got sick of people micing me up with a microphone on the guitar um I just wanted to rock up and plug it in. It doesn't sound quite as good as my old Yamaha. And that's the thing about Yamaha. If you want to get 75% right, get a Yamaha, a Yamaha anything. Um, once you get good and you start to have opinions, you can look for something that's toned more to your whatever. But if you if you want to toss a coin and, and be right most of the time, get something by Yamaha. Um, amplifiers, guitars, pianos, um, probably they don't do cars, probably motorbikes, I don't know much about motorbikes. But anyway, it had a really lovely light action, beautiful tone, and it wasn't expensive, and that's just typical Yamaha. Anyway, I uh, don't know what this make is, but anyway, it hurts to play this guitar. And maybe it hurts to hear it as well. <laughs> So for some reason, I like um, I like this bridge. Oh. We're alone, so they say. We're not alone in that way. Jesus. My eyes aren't what they were either. It's a bit clearer on the TV. So, where am I? When we're alone, it's real tough going. We tend to take part in someone else's play. Come with me. Right, okay. Let's have a look at this. I thought I just had a message from Instagram that I shared a post, but how can I do that when I'm here doing this? But it, it wasn't that. So. These are spending doing this and okay. Come with me, I won't hide. We go away on a ride. We'll meet each day, it's time to see. While we're young and almost free, I got to lose this skin. I'm imprisoned in. I got to lose this skin. I'm imprisoned in. Do not turn. All the things you think we've got Do not turn or hate to see What happened to the white Of oh, lost I got to lose this skin I'm imprisoned in I got to lose this skin I'm imprisoned in to 
the bridge. We're alone, so they say. Whoops. We're alone, so they say. We're not alone. Whoops. <laughs> Amazing. We're alone, so they say. We're not our own in that way. When we're alone, it's real tough going. We tear the tape apart. Someone else's play. That should be a D5. I'll have a look in a while, see what that is. Come, uh, come to me, I thought he said. That's not him anymore, he's dead What's it like to be so free? So free it looks like lost to me I gotta lose this skin, I'm imprisoned in Gotta lose it, ah, oh, where are we? Gotta lose this skin, I'm imprisoned in Gotta lose this skin, I'm imprisoned in Yeah, and so on. It does a lot more than that. I mean, well, a little bit more than that. It has the, um, uh, the violin in there and fades out and comes back in and fades out again. Oh, it's got piano Mickey Gallagher probably on the piano. Maybe not, but probably was. Who, um, whose kids sang on the album as well when they were very little. Uh, career opportunities um, and I didn't realise that Mickey Gallagher was the keyboardist from the Blockheads and I have to say this now as we're on late night music props um, the Blockheads were an amazingly tight band I mean if you YouTube them live two things YouTube them live uh, doing um, Rhythm Stick. Hit me with your Rhythm Stick. It's absolutely amazing, the, the, the tight. I mean, it's such a righteous thing to say as like a jazz musician or something, but the, the, the tightness of them, I, I wouldn't want to use it unless I really saw it too. And it's just beautiful. It's, it's, it's just beautiful. And then also... Um, and so amazing then a bit like Blondie were with not so much the type but to, to have all that work going on and then you just have this demure woman floating over the top of it like nothing's happening you know it's almost like animal on the drums and then there's this ballerina just standing there being beautiful and and demure and singing so beautifully you know and I think he was he was a right old urchin when he in jury but him sitting on the top of such a fantastic well, probably actually a bunch of jazz musicians, but such a fantastically tight band. And it really does show on Rhythm Stick. And um, uh, there was, oh, Google around and find people playing that bass line. It's like a lead guitar line. It's like a guitar solo, but it's a bass line. It's absolutely brilliant. Beautiful bass line. And while we're on the subject of this sort of thing, I would also like to say that on the old Grey Whistle test, with... I don't know if it was Sinead Jones or not. I can't remember her name. And there's a woman on the old Grey Whistle Test uh, singing with Thomas Dolby on Hyperactive. The energy in that song, on that version of it, I mean, all of the versions of it, but that particular one absolutely captures it. And I love that woman. The, the pride and dignity, the dignity is the word, the dignity with which she stands there and just nails her role is oh, it's just... Brilliant, really lovely moments in music, you know. Um, yeah, I do love music. I have a record company. <laughs> no one's ever heard of it except me. But it does exist. Um, and so was I supposed to when I taught myself out of it. Well, the inside of my head taught myself out of it, which is a bit stupid. Um, and 
I think I would have to go through quite a lot of physical pain to get back up to the not quite technically good enough standard by, by my wishes that I was. I was never a great guitarist. Well, no, actually, I'm, I'm, that's not what I meant to say. Technically, I'm not an accurate guitarist. I'm not someone who can pick out classical stuff and I'm not. Um, but what I do still have, I, I, I would need to just warm up again, polish up again, get back in the groove. But what I certainly did have when I was playing the guitar a lot was I was very resourceful with the tools I had, you know, the chords I knew, the abilities I had, and I could, and this is a good line for a gag, but I mean it in, in, the, in the nicest possible way. I could really create an effect um, with what I knew. I had, I had a unique sound and wherever I went, except for one particular strange occurrence, um, my guitar work was, I wish I was talking about someone else when I said this, cause it's, you know, but I, I was there so I can say this. Um, but it used to leave people, jaws used to drop. I could see him looking like, how the fuck is he making that sound with the guitar? And I think the thing is, is that I learned the guitar other than the aforementioned Ian. I learned the guitar from The Clash. Unfortunately, not this track at the time. I think it took me a while to realize how much I liked it, actually. Um, but also from ELO, Electric Light Orchestra, and people know like Mr. Blue Sky, but the thing about ELO, of course, it had the whole orchestra, and the guitar work was very, um, it had classic chords. But the thing is, is being a punk fan, I, and learning the guitar and teaching myself, really, I didn't really realize that you had to pick these chords. I was strumming them. I was just bashing them, really. What I wanted out of my guitar was energy, rhythm, and a sound that was almost like, it was almost like the amalgamation of all the sounds I wanted to hear. So it was almost like there were 15 musicians in the, you know, in the sound of my, it's like a mono, you know, imagine putting together, like, 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 What's his name? Uh, Phil Spector's Wall of Sound, where you got, I think a lot of that was because you couldn't have the separation. You got mono, you know, you got one speaker. Everything's coming down into that one speaker. And so you can't necessarily always pick out all the individual bits. You just end up with this overall, you know, cake. And I loved it. When I had a sound that for me sounded like a whole orchestra in a box. <laughs> uh, I'd done my job, you know, that's... And if somebody showed me a new chord, I'd write a song. And then they wouldn't, you know, we'd, we'd, we wouldn't, they wouldn't show me anything else. And so, but... Learning to play the guitar was for two reasons. It was in order to be able to write songs and it was to get the girls. And maybe I didn't say girls, maybe I said girl. <laughs> um, or maybe that's what I meant. But in that respect, it worked. And as soon as I was able to do that, I just hit a wall. Like, as soon as I could write songs from the chords and from the guitar work that I could accomplish, I, I never improved past that point. So I got to that point almost instantly and then just hit a wall. And then when I say the ref reference to girls, as an odd story, I sold my guitar once years ago because I needed some money to paint the flat that I was staying in. And I needed to paint the flat because I needed to just get my head out, get my eyes out of the inside of my head, you know, and do something external to my thoughts and 
and get into production and motion and momentum and get work and get a job basically. So I thought, all right, I'll sell the guitar because I'm just sitting here doodling on the guitar and pacing up and down and falling between the cracks, not really getting a product with anything. So I thought I'd do that, get a job, and then at some point, you know, start playing the guitar again. Anyway, it kind of worked because I did get, I painted the place, got a job, sold the guitar and everything. Um, typical thing with musicians. Oh, change it, you know, swap numbers and yeah, we'll have to stay in touch and we'll have to do a jam and you know you're never going to, but you sort of think you're going to and you never do. Um, so it was one of those things for the person or the people I sold the guitar to. And um, sometime later, maybe a month or so later, I don't even know how this happened, but ITV Telethon contacted me and said, we're doing an outdoor gig in Walthamstow. Um, you come down and play. So I was like, I think so. <laughs> ITV, yeah. And, um, yeah, the, it, that, it, anyway, I did it. But I didn't have a guitar. So I um, thought, at the time, I was thinking to myself, <laughs> it's not a very... It doesn't sound very complimentary what I'm about to say about someone, but if I mean it in an uncomplimentary way, it's, it's, it should probably be, it would be more correct to say it was something uncomplimentary about myself. Because um, I was a little bit out of touch with what it was I was trying to do, what it was I was interested in and stuff like that. But, but basically what happened is I sat there and I thought, man, I'm failing. I mean, I'm not even like doing quite bad or the odd little bad day or whatever. I was just like flatlining. It's like, you know, I'm, and I thought, yeah, I'm a hundred percent. I thought, I thought to myself, well, who's making, I don't know why I had this train of thought, but I thought to myself, well, who's, who's the, uh, who's making the decisions in my life? Because I'm thinking, you know, who, you know, your life is made up of decisions or indecisions, you know, and, who's influencing, who's making the decisions. I thought, well, it's me. So it is me. It's not like someone else manipulating me or their will is being forced. Maybe it was. But anyway, at the time, I just thought, well, it's me. Who's making the decisions in my life? Me. Okay, and what am, I, what am I basing those decisions on? I thought, what I want to do. And I was like, <laughs> there's your clue. I'm doing what I want and failing miserably. So I thought, yeah. And I thought, well, what? I thought the only thing I've got to do then is just do the opposite. So I thought, well, what don't I want to do? And completely out of the blue, she wasn't on my mind or anything. I just thought, oh, I don't want to get in touch with that girl I bought the guitar, you know, I sold the guitar to. <laughs> and I was like, well, what the fuck's that all about? Where did that come from, you know? And I thought, oh, yeah, but it's true though, isn't it? It's like, oh, fuck it, all right, just ring her. And I'm like, this is a bit like Dice Man, you know, roll the dice. And, and I was like, okay. So I rang up, said, I can I speak to her? These guys were like, who's this? I'm like, well, it's Paul. You know, they bought the guitar from me and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right. Okay, we'll leave it with us. And I was like, God, what was that all about? Put the phone down. And then quite soon after, it might have only been minutes after, I got a phone call, hiya, and it was the girl. It was her husband and wife bought my guitar. And I just wanted to speak to them. And uh, anyway, I spoke to her. She called me back. I think she called me back from work. And I said, hi, do you remember me? You, you, you bought my guitar. I bought the guitar from me a few weeks ago. And she said, yeah, yeah. Um, what can I do for you? I said, um... Can I borrow it back? <laughs> she was like laughing. Well, why is that? I said, well, I've been asked to do this gig and don't have a guitar and it's just a one-off and I just want to do this thing. And she said, yeah, all right, fine. Uh, so she said, um, I can't remember if she told me on the phone there and then. I don't think she did. Anyway, I went over and I thought to myself, I don't want to get caught up in this now. We're going to hang out and jam. She just seemed like someone different to me. And um, so I thought, 
I'm going to buy some, get this petrol station flowers. I'm going to buy some flowers from this petrol station and give them to her as a thank you when I take the guitar back, I think that was what I thought. But in the meantime, I'm going to give her the money that she paid for the guitar, which is like 50 quid. I'm going to leave that there with her on the table. Of course, I'm going to come back with the guitar, but she doesn't know that. So at least I'm going to say, look, there's the money. I will, obviously I will be back. She was like, oh, I don't care. She had nothing on it. There's no attention on it. She's like, yeah, it'll be fine. Anyway, so that's what I did. Did the gig. I, somehow, I could go into a record shop, play a guitar upside down quietly in a corner to myself and get a crowd of people around me. And I didn't even know I was there. And that had happened on a number of occasions. But sometimes I would play and it was like I had this uncanny ability to make the whole world disappear. <laughs> I played it. There wasn't very many people at this telethon gig. It was outdoors. It was on a big stage. It made it even worse. I mean, it's proper outdoor festival sort of stage. But I, was, I wasn't, I was the only thing on it. It was just me, the guitar and probably a microphone. And that was it. And about four people watching or something. It was painful, really, but anyway, I did it. Um, the same sort of thing happened at a, a school in Hackney one afternoon. They must have been school holidays or something. That was with an African band, and it was like five people there or something. There's probably more than that, but it felt like two men and a dog. Anyway, um, there were just some times where you could, I could almost feel it myself, though, that I was just part in the waves of humanity so that there was no one there i don't know why so i was singing into a vacuum or something anyway um i did have the feeling it was me doing it let me put it that way and um i'm not saying you know it's always the case but i did have the feeling that i don't, I don't think i was wrong either but anyway um just don't know why it was and i took the guitar back with these petrol station flowers from across the road in the petrol station i got talking and you know thank you and blah 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 and one of those things, every time I sort of thought, you know, I'm just going to say this and this and then sort of wrap up and get out of here. Never to be seen again sort of thing. And then I was like, mm, I'm still here talking. And so I did a bit more of that and a bit more. And then she told me something about herself, which I thought, well, that was quite touching really. But I sort of think, Maybe she shouldn't have done, but she can, I can be trusted, but how does she know that? Anyway, um, so I thought, oh, I'm just going to stick around a bit and sort of help her out with that. It's just a problem that she had. So it's just in a conversation and did a few things and, um, and somehow we sort of stayed in touch and, uh, and then, um, Well, cut a long story short, I married that woman and had a child with her <laughs> and started a business with her and bought this very place that I'm sitting now with her. Long-winded story, but there it was. See, the guitar got me a chick. <laughs> so, yeah, it was... Um, it's funny how we get what we ask. But I think there's two twists to that truth. One is that we tend to ask for some really dumb ass shit without knowing we've done it. And then we don't notice it when it's there. And I'm definitely one of those people that would make a wish, have it happen, and then fight it because I'd forgotten that I'd actually wished for that. And uh, I think it's really know thyself. <laughs> <laughs> That's my big, long, philosophical di diatribe. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, so, yeah. That was, um, and it was only at Christmas, just, what, six months ago now, seven months ago now, that I finally got rid of the car that we bought. Uh, together, well, we brought several, but the last one, so I had that for 20 years. So 
So that was a very profound uh, set of circumstances in my life. Um, and it was aided and abetted. You know, bring your own beliefs to this one. Maybe it would have happened in a different way or whatever. But um, it was centred around, oddly enough, uh, the guitar. And I think what was also quite interesting is it's quite funny because you could also say that I got my wife from the small ads because <laughs> I did because I put an ad in the paper to sell my guitar <laughs> and then called her up to buy it back. What the, what the the weird what basically she she was married at the time she just after the, anyway they they she divorced the guy. Um, split up, divorce a guy, and um, just in those, I don't know, within days, I guess, of buying my guitar, and about six weeks later, you know, there I was getting in touch, and that's why the people that I called were weird, because they were one, because she no longer lived there, and um, anyway, so they were kind of like, well, who are you, what's, you know, did you have anything to do with this, and I'm like, to do with what you know they didn't ask that but that was the attitude and I, I was just thinking what don't what is a really weird vibe <laughs> but um you know and I just think the thing is this you know what I was saying about it's not a the way I'm telling the story is how it happened and it's not a disrespect towards her um if anything it's a disrespect towards me but it's not even a disrespect towards me it's just that I was saying that that was the way it had to happen. And I think there was nothing wrong with being in that situation. But I had my own prejudices, whatever they were, and they would have gotten in the way. So, you know, sometimes you just, you know, uh, you know, I, I've found things that I needed in my life through sometimes through the most random acts, you know, um, a ferry breaking down, a, just a long list of just ridiculous things where when you're in that moment, you put tearing your hair out and then all of a sudden, bang, something comes through on it and you look back and you think, you know, that couldn't have happened any other way. That actually, and possibly, well, of course, it could have happened anyway, but but you just get the feeling that that is the only way that could possibly have happened. And um, and then you think, then the only other thing to say is, um, and am I glad that it did? And and here I am. Of course I am. Um, so, yeah, the guitar has gone, come in and out of my life over the years. And, um, yeah. I've got a bunch of songs from the 80s that really, I really want to fully get produced because I can hear what's in there. Just like every failing musician, I've got all these ideas in my head, I just don't know how to get them out. Yeah, same. Um, but it needs orchestration and it needs all kinds of things. And it's amazing that the people I know around me fit into what it is that I need, but I've never approached them to discuss it. Um, I've always wanted full orchestration and a gospel choir um, and various other things to just bring out everything that's in the, the music and in the songs. Um, and, you know, when I was in South Africa, I stayed with someone who's now had two Grammys for production of the Soweto Gospel Choir and um, another friend of mine who's sadly no longer with us you know he did the orchestration for the page and, page and plant well you know tour and did the the re the remake if you like of the wonderful Kashmir song um, and he spoke to me once I asked him about various things and he, I said, you know, I can't afford like a hundred piece orchestra. I remember Jeff Lynn from the ELO saying that once they, they'd had a few people and then they 
you know, a few musicians, you know, playing the cello, the violin, whatever. And now they had almost like a symphony orchestra. I think they even did have a symphony orchestra. And they're like, Jesus, man, we're, we're paying for these guys. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of studio. And we've got to know how to use them. And I sort of, and Jeff Lynn is a virtuoso, amazing singer, fantastic songwriter, brilliant producer. Uh, I think he's pretty handy on the guitar as well. And I think, does he play? I think he can play drums. Um, anyway, so I'm so proud of myself for having Joe Strummer of The Clash and Jeff Lynn of ELO and the band The Clash and the band ELO as the, my two soulmates in music. Because that's what music is. Music is just what communicates to you and those two do more than any other beings on this earth. Um, when it comes to music um, and there's the old soundtrack to my youth and all that sort of stuff that we all have with our favourite artists there's loads of people that I love but weren't, you know um, but there's sometimes you get artists and you say they're, they're mine love this guy love those guys that band are brilliant but these guys are mine and that guy's mine and she's mine <laughs> um, of course other people will say the same but you know there's a select few there's loads that of bands and, and artists that I like and that I love. But when you think, oh, okay, which ones of them are personally yours? And they, it narrows that list down. And, and right at the top of the tree are those two crackerjack <laughs> uh, communicators, basically. Joe Strummer has, well, had, no longer with us, so much soul, you know, to just say, oh, punk band. Uh, yeah, you're not looking, you're not looking, I'm not saying you need to start liking them if you don't like them, but um, the beauty inside that guy that came out, the energy, this sheer determination to nail a fucking top dollar night right through the back of you, no matter what, is just unprecedented um they were a good life put it that way um all of them classic thing of some of the you know the whole is greater than some of its parts you know punching above your weight no matter how good he's same as football you might have the best 25 players on the planet but unless you organize them in a way that is remarkably good remark is remarkable you're still not going to win anything unless you're in a league that no one cares about. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, this friend of mine, he, he said, no, what we do is we get, instead of 100 people, we get 30 of them in this orchestra. And, and then we get them to play, you play, you know, we do a take and then we get them to swap instruments. Not necessarily that the violinist is now on the cello, but if there's three, five, four, five violinists, they just swap each other's instruments and play again. And we overdub that, and we and then we we'll, we we'll, we'll do that, you know, thirty odd takes or whatever of, of of doing that. So you don't just get a copy and paste of the same thing. You get it in a new unit of time, and you get it with just the nuances of because you react, you you get a different sound out of somebody else's instrument and whether you are trying to get the sound you were getting from yours you're probably not going to do that so you're going to get differences but you also as an artist you react if you can hear it's why I don't like having headphones on and stuff I like to hear what I'm I'm doing because I want to respond and I want to adjust I want to you know like where you play the room you do it when you're talking you're trying to make an effect you you will talk to the acoustics of a room you know, just a person, just anybody, even a child will do that. Um, so um, that's what he would do. So that would keep, that's when they had, a, you know, problems with budget. You know, I'm thinking problems with budget. You've got 30, a 30 piece symphony orchestra instead of a 100 piece one. I'm, I'm still not there, mate, either. But good to know. But I just thought to myself, I'm going to, you know, I'm meeting these people and, I really want to open out what I have 
um, and utilize what I have around me in order to make something that, that will stand the test of time. Uh, and to, the, to, to now, up to now, I haven't done that. I got mired down in whatever things we get mired down in ourselves and life and God knows what else. And probably none of those things, but whatever it is, it needs to be in order to just make sure that it never did quite happen <laughs> or even nearly happen. Um, so I was going to say something else, then, but don't remember what. But um, anyway, so they, 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 I think the thing is that my songs are like a problem to me because I can write very quickly. I can really write a song very quickly, especially if I hear music that I like, you know, melody in the words just, and I'm like, oh, that was what was on my mind. And you just end up with these, you know, unfinished oil paintings just clogging the place. And I think unless you've got a conveyor belt to get it out the door via some kind of production, some kind of distribution, you know, then they just, what are they? You've just sung to yourself effectively. So I got that point where I, you know, it was almost like I did a test. Okay, can I play music? Yeah. Can I make songs? Yeah. What are they like? Fine. How do other people think about them? <laughs> they really like them. Excellent. Cool. So I know I can do it. Okay, I'll, come, I'll be back in a minute. I don't know what I went away for. I don't know what I went away to. I don't know why I didn't come back. The only time I'd come back was when I'd scuttle around thinking I should be doing it and then scuttle off again. And probably the same as so many artists would say the same thing, but um, anyway, that was that. So, yeah, I know what I was going to say now. Um, I always used to think it'd be nice to have a little bit more technical ability, like to, like to be accurate. When I, when I say accurate, I mean, you know, your finger not just being on the note, but press down the right amount and you have a finger not getting in the way and hitting that, you know, just the accuracy, just, just, there, there was a thing called, um, um, an arpeggiator in the software music world where you play a chord and it would break it open and, and it would lay out the notes in that chord. So you'd, you'd get picking instead of just this chord and, you know, my human arpeggiator wasn't very good. <laughs> um, but I remember one day, um, quite funny, I was walking down Park Lane. I used to live in London. I don't know if I was living there at the time, but I used to walk down Park Lane. I used to live in Belgravia amongst other places and working on Tottenham Court Road, come walking down. Park Lane at night. It was really nice. I like that. And being a petrol head as well, we had the BM showroom and a few other ones. I had the McLaren showroom down there for a little while. Was like the McLaren F1, like, I'm talking 1990 or whatever it was. Anyway, um, one day I just popped in and thought, hmm, I want to look at the 3 Series. We did end up buying one, but a bit later. But I thought, yeah, I want to have a look, see what I think of those. So I went in, had a look, got talking to a guy. He said, what do you do? I said, well, I sort of have a little... Graphic at the time, I think it was graphic design business. Said, but I can't do music as well. He said, "Oh, I do music." I said, really? He said, "Yeah." I said, um, "What kind of music do you do?" He said, "Oh, you know, I play bass." And actually, he said, "I used to play bass. I'm getting now into ukulele or something." Or maybe he told me that when I saw him next. Can't remember, but he definitely told me he played bass. He said, "As a matter of fact, I'm playing with a band." Um, uh, uh, I can't remember where it was. It wasn't the Troubadour. It might have been, oh, I think it might have been the back, not the roundhouse with the music machine, the old music machine. It's, like, it's somewhere like that. Anyway, it's in London. So I'm playing with them, come and see us or something. I said, yeah, all right, I will. So I went down there. He didn't turn up for whatever reason. Maybe he wasn't going to turn up. Maybe, maybe he didn't say he was going to be there, but I think he did. But anyway, I went and saw the band that he was meant to be playing bass for and it was a guy and his guitar and two girls and a djembe drum and that was it 
Was it two girls? Or there might have even just been one girl at that time. And my fucking jaw just dropped. Uh, and I got goosebumps. I was just watching them like, whoa. And here's the first time I saw a guitarist who played like me, but he had a lot more technical ability. So he could get more of that message out. And I listened and I could hear him doing exactly what I do. He was playing everything in that guitar. He was the rhythm section, the bass, the, the, the everything. The whole orchestra was in his guitar. And I just said to him, I spoke to him afterwards and I said, look, I'm just going to tell you now. You, can't, you have to replace yourself so that all those other instruments you're playing in the guitar are played by others and you're left singing and playing the guitar. So you need a bassist, you need a drummer, you need these other things because it is fucking incredible what you're, what you're doing. And, and he was really obviously very happy. He's a fantastic guy. Anyway, that is a guy that they did do that. They put the rest of the band together and it was amazing. And one of my most disappointing things in life probably so far is that, and I knew it at the time, I just knew it. I was watching them and thinking, they're going to go bang. They're going to blow up before they get there. How can we fucking capture this before it's too late? And it became a bit of a panic. And they did go in the studio in the end, by which time we'd sort of been, well, they were asked who their representatives were on some gig. Uh, they were doing, I oh, can't remember where that was, Alexandra Park, was it? can't remember. Um, and we thought, because we had a local press there, I said, oh, oh we are, we're their reps. And then we sort of became, we used to sort of say they're managers or management, but I, I don't really feel comfortable with that. I think they took care of themselves. Um, they probably needed help with that, but I don't think we, me and my wife at the time, really brought that much to it. But we were definitely part of the team, put it that way. And who knows what we were doing, but we were doing it and we were helping when, you know, whenever we could in any way we could. But I didn't go in the studio with them. and What they produced in the studio was, was fine, was good. But the stuff prior to that, which I have on, to this day on cassette, um, I never captured um, in any real decent quality, uh, but amazing. Um, and there's every so often there's a track or two that in particular with the guy now is pretty much solo. Um, in particular, the really captures kind of like my love for him because he he, he just he's so, he's like a I don't, by this I don't people seem to think if I say like what I want to say is that he's such a gentle soul and then you think oh it's some pushover or something he's not he's here, here on planet earth like the rest of us and he's getting his shit done <laughs> but I suppose a bit, for me, possibly would put him a very close, like Joe Strummer and Jeff Lynn to me are, are they're the same. They're, they're not the same person, but they're the same thing. They're not even tied. If you get a race that's a tie, that's two separate things that did it in the same amount of time or, or hit just as hard. Somehow they're the, they're the same thing. So you can't really say which one's better. For me, Trevor's, Trevor's kind of like standing next to them, <laughs> watching that, you know. That's, as I say, that's, that band was called Tear. And, it's, yeah, my friend, my great friend Trevor, um, Trevor Jones, Trevor Piggott. Um, but that's, that's someone who, I honestly listen to his stuff. He's a, he, he uh, this isn't even modesty. We're talking about an actual technical fact here. He is, I still can't use the word bigger because then it's subjective. He is technically a far 
more accurate guitarist than I am, to put it that way. Um, most people just say, yeah, he's a better guitarist. He's got, he, I don't know if he's classically trained, but he, but he can play classically. Um, um, as far as I can hear, he can. He's also good enough as a drummer to get his stuff down. And same with piano. And got a great voice, great songwriter. And some of his songs just, some of his solo stuff um, after the band that were called, called Tear. Um, the stuff of Tear, he knows I, I, is my favorite really. Um, but all of the stuff he's done since of decent quality, some of it in particular, like the other day, I found myself playing a couple of tracks and just, just thinking, oh my God, it's, you, no one else can, there's nothing else that's going to do that, what just happened there. It's just, just brilliant. So I threw something up on Facebook and said talent or something like that, which he saw and thanked me for. <laughs> um, but yeah, just a really... I'd say generous, like a, a, just a, a just a good guy, just a decent guy, fantastically capable artist um, that needs to be. I mean, he produces well, but it's definitely there will be. It would be lovely to have someone else capture all of that and get it out um, in a decent enough volume to get a whole bunch of people to acknowledge him and be glad, all the better for it, you know, glad to have heard him. He needs to be heard. It doesn't matter how many, but he he needs to be found by those who need to find him because he, he's, he's a, just a really great artist. So... Um, and there's a lot of things that music has done, like that sort of thing, meeting people like that and having a little bit of inside track with them as well, you know, you helping them gig and having conversations with them about their music. And, and I've always been very, very I think careful is, is probably the right word, but it might not show the right portray the right thing I've always been very I don't know why I keep wanting to say this word accurate but responsible maybe I've always tried to be as precise as I could about what I think I've heard and what I think needs to be done because I don't want you know if I if I want to help then I want to help and if something is good and I want to help it then I then I need to make sure that I have helped you know, I don't want to make it worse, you know. You put a guy in his head, get a guy suddenly to start trying to do what he's doing or, you know. It's like when I talk to somebody, I really like to see the light go on and then grin and just go, yeah, yeah, that's you got it, you got it, you nailed it, I think, good. Then there's no residue, you know, to my contribution. It's just, it's just done everything it's needed to do. It hasn't done anything else. It hasn't left any taste or you could probably even forget that it was me that had the comment because he understood it so well, it became his own. So he wouldn't even know now who the hell said that. I don't know, I think, I can't remember. Actually, I think, I think I've always known that. It's like, no, I was there the day you realized. It's like, I wouldn't even say that. But that's what I think is, is if you've, I think that's the thing. If you want to help somebody, yeah, there we go. You won't pull this off, what I'm about to say, but leave no residue. Leave no residue. You know, um, you know, don't leave a stain. You know, don't leave a mark. Don't leave a scar. You know, if you're going to help somebody, um, withdraw with only the lasting benefit of the help you gave, not any other legacy. And of course, 
you don't need to be paranoid about that. But if you um, if you do a really good job of making sure that's always what you're going for, and if you're a good communicator, then I think that's what you'll pretty much achieve. You, you know, it's a bit like saying about perfection. Just oh, if you can go for it, and you'll get close. And then you got there was the old saying of the law of diminishing returns, where you think ten percent more effort would have gotten us about a tenth of a percent more of what we were kind of doing. So you get to the point you think, all right, now we're starting to micromanage, so you drop it, let go now, you know. So that's what I think I, I did. I had other things to say, but I couldn't say it in a way that was precise enough to get that through and changed. It would have just become some more noise and opinion and it's like unless I can pu punch through with something precisely what's going to kind of take care of what I'm trying to say or what I'm trying to do then I'm probably better just leaving alone so it got to that point where I'd, I just thought I can't really do help you guys much more without getting embroiled in in the whole thing and and that's not really going to add any value so step back hopefully you'll manage to do the rest yourself and and I can and I'll always pipe up when I have something particular to say or do or help or give you know see a bunch of hungry people you don't say to them wouldn't it be nice if we had some food if you see a hungry bunch of people if you want to help them you say bang there you go cake <laughs> done it's like oh that's amazing yeah I right, could you're welcome, brilliant, carry on. Now you have cake as well, which was needed. And that's it. And then you, my work here is done. You know, you back into the dark corner you go until you look and think, hmm, she needs a pair of slippers. <laughs> you know, so that was sort of, that's probably my ideal scene or my, I don't know if it's my philosophy, but it's what I, it feels like what I'm trying to do. When I'm satisfied it's when I've been able to put across what I'm trying to say with the minimal amount of blah around it. It has the impact intended and I can withdraw with no lasting legacy other than the intended, um, you know, impact or effect or whatever. Probably no different to anyone else, you know. Um, Sometimes you need to have a bit of sweat on your brow to know that you've, or give yourself the illusion that you've um, put it all out there, you know. Come back from war, if you have to go to war, at least come back with a cut. <laughs> Let people know that you, you were in the game, you know what I mean? Anyway, so... So many things I'm thinking I'm going to wrap up now, I think it's 10 to 1, but um, Celebrity Centre London, Poetry by Candlelight. First time I heard about that, I was like, oh, really? I mean, really, literally, Poetry by Candlelight. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. I'll come along. So I come along. I'm like, fuck, this is amazing. <laughs> Sit there in the dark, in a circle, in a room. Guys, I'm going to read a poem. I don't write poetry, but here's a poem I really like. Ever since I was a kid. You know, okay, cool. Read it. A couple of people say, yeah, that really reminded me of how blah and blah, blah, blah. And a few other people say a few other things. Someone else says, hey, here's one I wrote. And you just go around the room and... It's amazing, isn't it, art? Oh. I mean, those nights, we've all had those nights where it's one, two o'clock in the morning, you're in someone's back garden in the summer, a um, few candles going, a few beers, probably I don't drink, but, maybe, you know, everyone's had a, a little taste of what makes them happy. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, it's a lovely thing to share with the you know those types of people the right kind of people for you you know and 
I've had a number of those with music and, you know, so into that situation, if you throw in a guitar or if you throw in the fact that two thirds, three quarters of the people there are musicians, you know, somebody's just going to start banging on the table or a little drum or something and you do some stuff and you just have some sort of light jam. And for me, in that situation, I'll be looking, literally, I'm thinking, oh, I can't be bothered to put all the work in on this. I'm like I was doing there with Lose His Skin, it's like, forget the suspended, augmented, and the... <laughs> I just... I just saw some straight chords on this, but... Um, you know, because all you're trying to do is make a big ball of energy for everyone to wonder at and squeeze and enjoy. <laughs> and then you're done, and you think, oh, it was... That was another fucking lovely time I had in that house, you know, or in that household or whatever. And uh, there's some people in Plymouth, and there's some people in Cornwall who have that same thing. So maybe quite interested in the bass um, guitar, but maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'll do some music again. See, that was one of mine. There was, um, this is, um, an example. This is a clash, a clash. This is an ELO. Well, I suppose I'd have to say it's an ELO chord progression. I haven't played it for ages, but let's see what happens. That's uh, Sweet as the Night from Out of the Blue, which is the album Mr. Blue Sky was on. But When the day is done and there's nowhere to run And the people of the city are all lost And one in your city dress, you're standing still I shouldn't even sing it in that key But it's too late at night really for me to be singing this with the neighbours That would be annoying them with the guitar um, But what my point was this, is that if you you've just heard the way I play it, but if, if I show you the chords, see, that I'd be doing like, okay, so that, that's an E, right? But, so, there's all that in there, right? Okay, but what is that? See, I'm not even playing it. See, I would still strum chords that would be, you would normally pick out because that's where all the detail was. But if you play them together, because, you know, a scale works, it's going to be in harmony. You can even throw something out that isn't if you want to punch something through. It's a bit like if you make a mistake, as long as you you know the sooner you can come along with a correction with with the right you know if you press the wrong note as soon as you can press the right note you will have made the wrong note right because it's it just becomes expression like um uh, i think hammer on it's not hammer ons and hammer offs um be like um like so you think there's this, so you, this day that would be wrong, and that's right, but sounds right. So, you know, that would, anyway, that would, um, that would be my thing is that I'd be playing chords that you would normally 
dismantle. You'd play, you know, you'd pick at, you'd play almost classic, you'd play one string at a time, you know, some chord, third string, fifth string, sixth string, first string. With me, it would be, it would be strummed or even bashed, or, you know, like. And that's what I was always fascinated with when I was playing the guitar is just being um, resourceful. So with The Clash, I didn't have too much patience for any chords of theirs that were um, anything out of the ordinary. But with the ELO tracks, you, you know, it's been like I remember playing some Kate Bush stuff and thinking, geez, he's really got to work to even just, even just, you know, bash out her stuff. Um, your hands are on the go, the, you know, chord after chord after chord. You're playing chords like, like someone would just play a lead riff or something. But, you know, when you, and there'd be certain bits you know, when it goes from that chord to that chord, I think, I love that feel. But in order to get to that feel, I've got to learn the rest of it. Otherwise, it's not going to... I'm not going to get to that bit. So, yeah, ELO, you, you didn't have any choice. It wasn't an ELO song if you were... You couldn't just play major chords. Even if you weren't going to pluck them, you were going to pick them. It wasn't going to... That's the other thing. It would sound like, it would sound different, but you would go with the melody even if you just bashed the chord rather than picked it. And so you'd be in tune. If you're singing in an ELO song and you were just strumming or bashing it, um, I mean, if you've got access to ELO, or if you know it, you listen to Sweet as the Night, it doesn't sound like the way I'm playing it on the guitar, but I can assure you, you can sing the way I play it on guitar, you can sing exactly the same. I can follow along with that song and I'll be in tune, providing I hit the chords, um, even though I don't sound like it. Um, and sometimes you have to remember as well, there's a lot of overdubs and stuff, you know, you go and see your favourite band live and you, um, I mean, I saw Pink, I was watching some YouTube stuff, Pink Floyd doing some tracks from, oh, I was amazing, from um, Great Gig in the Sky, from uh, various other bits from Dark Side of the Moon and stuff. And I think they had three girls for that incredible solo vocal in order to do it live. Um, maybe also because of the range you know, you've got to find someone with a five octave range or something, <laughs> which you can do, but um, anyway, you know, you, you can't always replicate live what you did in the studio sort of thing. A lot of times, you do a demo tape, yeah, and our guy wants to come see you live anyway, wants to see that you can replicate that. So, um, basically, There is a certain amount, if I was sitting here with Jeff Lynne and he had an acoustic guitar, he probably wouldn't be able to make it sound like the album version of Sweet as the Night. But the point is that I would learn the chords so that I could play the song, but I wouldn't pick the chords, I'd bash the chords. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to twang the guitar. And um, But I did want to bring all of the detail out um, and just like my old mate Trevor you know in the meantime all right, I'll play the bass line and the lead and the piano the drums and the violin on my guitar <laughs> I'll just mash it all into into one overall sound and you'll be listening to it thinking what the fuck is that and you'll either like it or you won't. 
I was popular live. People who heard me play live, first time I ever played live, was with an acoustic guitar kneeling on the floor, mic on the guitar and mic on me, a heavy metal jam night. Just turned up and did a song of my own, a song of mine called Nightshine, and um, I, they loved it. They genuinely loved it. I was so nervous. I couldn't. I, not. I had pins and needles in my in my arm, and it. it I couldn't even feel my fingers, never mind bend them. Uh, I was just shaking and I literally couldn't play another song. And I and I apologise, I, I, I can't do it. Um, but they loved it, but they wanted more. And eventually I went back there with <laughs> two acoustic guitars and an African. <laughs> and we we did an, an African song. We, in fact, we did Honey Tree, a song of mine. And... Um, I wrote Honey Tree because I met this guy on a boat coming back from Holland and um, stayed in touch and ended up, um, he showed me, he was a guitarist as well, he showed me a traditional African chord, just very simple, G, C, D, C, whatever, and um and as soon as he showed me, it took him a few seconds. I was like, I want like this, bang. And that was it, song just done. Song was written in live, a two minute song. Um, and it's, you know, by the time you repeat one of the verses, it's three and a bit minutes or whatever, but, um, but it's just written instantly, just like my hands couldn't get it down fast enough. And that is always the thing. I hate it when it's gone from your head before you got it down. So, um, so we did that, and he's, uh, he'd, I'd sing a sen I'd sing a line in English. He'd sing a line, well, a, a verse in English. He'd sing a verse in Lingala. Uh, he was from the old Zaire Congo, and um, they loved it. I mean, it's literally heavy metal jam night. Like, it's the Plough in Kenton, if anybody knows there. Went down there, got on stage, mic'd up our guitars. He was like a big black guy with a bald head and an acoustic guitar. The guy had just come off stage singing like Route 66 or I Can't Get No Satisfaction or something. You know, it's typical jam night. And But they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And um, I've gone back one more time, can't remember. Anyway, um, taught myself out of it, really, music-wise. Um, and then that grew bigger than me. So it just didn't, didn't happen. Um, and the old everything, everything happens for a reason, but what does nothing happen for? <laughs> um, and I think it would be really nice to be able to just get down how I hear my songs properly and, you know, in a, in a world where independent artists' music isn't suppressed and people aren't shadow banned and stuff like that, to then get my music out in enough volume for it to pick up those who are really happy that they've heard it. That would be really nice. And what percentage of people that hear my stuff done the way I would like to present them to them, um, you know, would like them? I, I don't know. It, that doesn't really so much matter to me. It's almost like I feel like saying, if, as long as everyone's heard what I have to say, um, I'm done. I'm happy with that because there's enough people amongst that to have made it worthwhile, well, depending on what you've got to do to get everyone to hear it, but, but then you have a connection, you've, you've done something for someone, you've, you've, you've made them happier for having heard of you. And if that's one person in a hundred, one person in a hundred thousand, I'm not really that 
I'm not really that bothered because it also answers a question. Is how many people would like this? Who would like this? Who are they? What do they do? What do they get up to? Who's glad that I sung this song? And, and if I'm not happy about it and someone else is, it's like, yeah, all right, but oh, I'm, okay, it's great that you like it and I don't want to disrespect that. But it's a bit like somebody might not like what I'm wearing, but as long as I'm happy with it, I don't really care. It works both ways. It, it's like I'm more concerned about what somebody might think if I don't feel that I've represented myself properly. I don't think I'm alone with that. I'm, I wouldn't mind betting that every one of us is like that. You know, it's like, that's remember in the 80s, 90s, it was like, that. that's what I'm talking about. That was the same. And that's exactly it. This is what I'm, you stand, you know, that's what you, you walk out of your house in the morning and go, that's what I'm talking about. This is, this is how I'd do it. How would you do it? It was exactly these shoes, exactly these trousers, exactly this time of day, exactly the, the way I'm feeling right now and exactly heading off to wherever the hell I'm heading off. That's how I'd have it done in my life, you know? And then if someone says, mm, I don't know you like that, it doesn't bother you, does it? It really doesn't matter. But it's almost like if you look and you think, this, is, this isn't, you know, I feel like a monkey. You, you might think, oh, he's wearing Vivian Westwood. That's amazing. It's like, I feel like a twat. Not because it's Vivian Westwood, but because this isn't mine. And now, I don't, I don't, whether somebody likes it or doesn't like it, I'm just going to be irritated by that. So, you could say yeah, you shouldn't really get hung up on what people think, but I don't think I do if I feel that I have properly, I've represented myself on that subject, you know? If I told somebody I liked a football team that I didn't like and they were like, oh, that's amazing, I would feel uncomfortable. But if I told them, oh, Wildstone, they're like, who? I don't really care because it's Wildstone and it's true and that's who I love. And Newcastle has been for a while. I know it's popular now or will be, but couldn't tell you how it comes with Newcastle because it's not very near Wildstone. Um, but... Um, Didn't particularly like walking around Wildstone High Street or anything, so it's not really about the place, it's just about here's, here's who or what I have an allegiance to, or here's, <laughs> in to put it, coin a phrase, here's what or who I identify as, and then take it or leave it. But even I find, even with a compliment, if you sort of think, that's not how I do it, and somebody says that was great, I at that point tend to think that they're just saying that. And probably more than I would think anything else. I doubt if I'd even be disappointed and think, oh, I wish you could hear what I really want to say. I, I don't think I would think that. I would, I would almost think, well, you shouldn't like it, or you're just saying it, or it has no... It sounds sad to say, but it's almost like it has no real value to me when somebody has an opinion of something about me that I don't have a acknowledgement for, I don't have a seal of approval for. And even sometimes my bad actions, I look and I, think, I still give it a seal of approval. You know why? Because that's all I can handle in that circumstance at that time or in that way or on that reason. That's, that's, what, that's all I've got, you know? You lost your temper at blah. That's how it goes down. When you, if you do that, I'm sorry. I, I would genuinely like to not have that reaction, but I know it's that's how it happens with me on that subject. So don't know what else to say. But then when I do something where I think, you know what, that's just not me. I'm not comfortable whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, and I don't think I'm alone in that. You know, so it's the same with my music. I just want to feel that I've done justice to my thoughts, if you like. Those sounds, thinking of them as Bose's thoughts or ideas. And when I have done that and when I can hear it the way I had intended it, or who knows, maybe it's almost like I think 
if it was to go off onto a higher level and go even better, then I would think, all right, let me strip it back to how I actually heard it and not get carried away just to say, all right, this is the original thought. But yeah, I have to admit the embellished, edited, grew out of the idea version is better or something. Fine. A lot of the time an artist revisit their old tracks and re reimagine the song and you think, yeah, it's not as good. Um, unless you're a real major fan of that artist, you usually listen to think, you know, like the third remix, fourth remix, fifth remix. You think, yeah, somehow I still want to hear the original. And the original might not be the original, just the first one you heard, the one that captured your imagination. When it's captured your imagination, the work's done. It's almost like you can't improve on it at that point. Look, Kate Bush's Hounds of Love, do you really think that she could do it again and somehow make it even better? I don't think she could. Maybe she could, but I don't think anybody would think it was better unless they heard that for the first time. So I think that's the thing, is that you just properly want to represent yourself, don't you, on whatever you're talking about, whether it's something you how you know you want to be able to express yourself. So that's how, that's what I meant to say, whether it's words, song. My three, three favourite movies... Uh, an album I, t I told everyone they should listen to, uh, clothes, uh, the way I arranged my bedroom as a kid, you know, it's like my mates think I'm an idiot, but I love sitting on my bunk bed looking out the top window, whereas I couldn't do that if I moved it away from the radiator or something, you just think that it doesn't, you know, whatever. As long as you're happy, it's almost like it makes you more resilient, more ex accepting to the responses of others. And because even if you don't care what someone says, somehow you're actually accepting it. You're not resisting it. You're not saying, don't do that. It's like, you just, you're saying, all right. So you're actually accepting it. Saying, yeah, he told me it was shit. He probably means it too, <laughs> you know? Um, don't care. I got it done. And I came last in the singing competition, but the one person who voted for me was genuinely happy to have heard my song. And I can't believe that I've had that effect, made that effect on someone, connected with someone like that. You know, that would, you'd say, that's all I take away from I came plumb last, didn't even get me bus fare home, <laughs> but I got it done the way I'd have it done. And there was this one person who was like, that is fucking awesome. And you think, okay, they were wearing calipers and I think that's what they said or it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, what you had an idea and somebody said, I got it, I got it. And I'm, I'm better for it. And you think, then, then my work here is done. And I suppose marketing is about probably two things, is getting enough people to ha to you know to run yourself by enough people to pick up the ones who'd say yeah I'll have some of that and then that would probably be the first thing and then really and truthfully you then want to see as soon as you have a pattern of who the hell is liking this shit that's who you want to narrow down to communicate to because it was still getting in the hands of others, but you know, you want to reach your audience. Um, if I was talking to every single, if I, if I had the chance to talk to every single person on the planet, I would, I would accept that. I'd say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that, I'll have some of that. But having done that, I'd, my first thing would be who liked it? Who, who, not even so much who liked it, who, somebody used this word earlier, it's a good word, who, uh, who did it, who resonated with it, you know? Who, who went, oh yeah, I see what he's saying, fucking hate it, but I can't stop hearing it, you know? Um, that's what you want to know, it's like, well, Looks like you're in a niche market because of the 7 billion people that heard your message, you've found 403 who had something to say about it and 
27 of them were positive. <laughs> so fine, who are they? Well, they all live in Nashville for some reason. Uh, 72 year old women at a conservative club in Nashville. And you're like, let's go take a look at that place. <laughs> what the hell was happening down there that wasn't happening anywhere else? Go in there and you look and you realize that they have a, you know, an old, it's the only place, you know, some guy is retired now, the old janitor rigged up a 12 speaker system or something and he, they haven't done a very good job of keeping it working, but holy cow, the song sounded different in there, in, you know, like in Back to the Future. Marvin, 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 it's, was it Chuck, 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 it's your cousin, Marvin, Marvin Berry. You know that sound you're looking for? <laughs> and um, and then you'd be like, okay, so that's how we have to present it. It has to be heard to sound like that, or these are the people that want to hear it. So now I just, I want to speak to them. Because if you then played, if you did a gig to just those 27 people, for instance, a ridiculous example, but someone else would hear it as well. So it's not like, well, what if everyone liked a, a, a different one of your songs or whatever you think? I, I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. It's like, I have found who is moved by my existence <laughs> on that subject. My existence as a baseball player, my existence as a guitarist, my existence as just a person, my existence as a guy in a Levi's ad, whatever. I found who is mo who was moved by that experience, and um, and now that's who I talk to because when I want to reach them, you know, so you can talk to other people if you want to. But anyway, so it starts with saying what you want to say, or saying saying it how you would say it whether it's clothes, words, song, whatever. And then, um, you know, the rest will follow. I don't, I don't think you can impinge upon someone and have nothing come of it, of any use. So, who wouldn't want to do that? And there you go. It's time to turn in. Thank you for watching my strange, probably fairly unusual Facebook Live. That song was probably so different from the original that there'll be no copyright um, notice on it from the bots because <laughs> they'd be like some guy playing a guitar we think it was a guitar <laughs> um well, anyway we're going to bed we stretch out and go to bed um thank you for watching this whenever you did patrick thanks for joining whenever you did <laughs> and take care and i'll see you soon cheers <laughs>